Hi, everyone. Welcome to a very exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted to be talking with the author of Moco Magic, African Icons, uh, as well as History Comics, and that is author Tracy Baptiste. Tracy, thank you for jumping in and chatting with me. Hi, thank you for having me, Jason. A pleasure. Absolutely a pleasure. Uh, are there any particular titles, any particular works that you've been engaged with that I didn't mention there that you want to make sure to include? Um, I think probably people know me best for the Jumbies trilogy. Mm -hmm, um, that's mm -hmm. the one everybody knows. And of course, there's a, a kid's version of that called Looking for a Jumbie. And um, another picture book is um, Mermaid and Pirate, which is those are the, those are the guys that just moved off my. Um, <laughs> yeah, I see pirate off, right there. <laughs> off my chair, Mermaid and Pirate. Um, so, yeah, so all of those. And I have a new one coming out um, in the fall. Well, Moko Magic, this one comes next month um, in mm -hmm. August. Mm -hmm. And um, Boy 2.0 is my first sci-fi and it comes out in October. Love it. Love it. Love the science fiction. Love exploring genre. I just became a force ghost. I'm sorry. Hold on just a moment. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I saw that. These are not the droids you're looking for. That's right. Or maybe they Look are. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> um, so I typically ask sort of an author origins question, and I'm curious about what connected you with storytelling. How, how did you decide you wanted to become an author? Well, I grew up in Trinidad. Um, the, you know, the country is Trinidad and Tobago, but I grew up on the big island, which is Trinidad. And it is a very literary place. We have a lot of writers that come out of Trinidad and Tobago. And um, I think it's because we are a culture that is very, very steeped in storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so Calypso, for example, which is, you know, the kind of music that that people dance to during carnival um, is very much a storytelling um, platform because it is just a story set to song with a great beat that you can dance to and a catchy mm -hmm. chorus. Mm -hmm. But often Calypso, especially um, the older type of Calypso was a way to um, give people news, to update people on what was the, what were the political goings on, cultural goings on, uh, that sort of thing. And that has still remained a little bit part of that, um, uh, of what Calypso still is today. Not quite as much. It's more um, kind of more party music now and less, um, you know, sort of news telling and, and keeping people abreast or like making fun of, of, of certain things that are going on in the news. But there's still a little bit of that. So I think that there are a lot of writers come out of Trinidad because we are very much steeped in this tradition of telling stories and, um, you know, like just making sure that people have a grasp of things that are happening around them, but specifically couching them in a way that's entertaining. So I, I think that is a really good um, breeding ground for a lot of writers. So it it is not it, it is not too much of a surprise to me how many writers actually come out of the island. So I was very steeped in that as a kid. And I knew that I wanted to be a writer very, very early on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think I was three years old when I told my mom that, you know, like I wanted to be a writer. Of course, at three, I didn't really understand what that meant. I really thought it was just like you got your name to be really big on the cover of a book. Like that's that's the thing that I I knew and that you could have stories inside the book. I But I didn't really have any concept of you know, you can't at three, like, how does that happen mm -hmm. or, or whatever. But I, I knew that I, um, first of all, my mom would buy me any book I wanted. Um, and I knew that I would go through the books and I have like memories of going through with crayon and being like, I don't like this ending. This gotta be a better way. <laughs> like, There's yeah, gotta be a better yeah. way to end this. And like <laughs> rewriting certain things and just kind of like making things my own. So... And that didn't seem to be like an unusual thing for me. It did not. It did not strike me as something that was impossible or difficult or whatever. Because there were plenty of you know writers who came out of the island, but also like plenty of you know Calypsonians 
who were making up stories all the time and setting it to songs. So it just, it all seemed like, oh yeah, this is thing, this is something that people do. So yeah, sure. This is, this is what I'll do when I, when I grow up. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very cool. Is it VS Nepal? Is VS Naipaul is Trinidadian. uh-huh, Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, I thought yeah. so. So Mm-hmm. yeah, and you know, like he is one of the major luminaries, right? But we also had, you know, like Claude McKay. Well, is Claude McKay actually from Trinidad? Yeah, we sort of claim everybody who's like Trinidadian, who's Yeah. like Caribbean, actually. Um, and I can't remember if um Claude McKay specifically is Trinidadian, but there were a lot of them and They were required reading at school. Like we read a lot of authors who came out of Trinidad specifically or from the Caribbean, um, you know, in general. Um, Edna St. Vincent Malay, I think, is uh, also um, was one. Um, so, no, that's wrong. Not Edna St. Vincent Malay. I'm literally thinking of somebody else It's whose name is also Edna, whose book I have on my bed right now. I'm like looking at it. It's over there. I literally just picked up an anthology of like Caribbean um, short stories um, from like the eighties or something like that, that she edited and it's, it's over there, but it's not Edna St. Vincent Millay, who's a poet, who's not who I'm thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> always reading always reading i love that love Yeah. the the expanse and uh you're also somebody as i mentioned a bit ago that works across uh, different approaches different forms different age groups uh so i'm curious what that shift is like between say like a non-fiction series like african icons versus uh fiction with mogo magic picture books uh how, how do you make those changes and transitions You know, it sort of um, has more to do with the story that pops into my head than how I approach it as an as a writer. Um, I feel like when Mermaid and Pirate came to me, it was literally because I I was looking at these two guys in my chair, and I thought, oh, how would they communicate with each other? Like Mermaid. you know, is not going to speak the same language as pirate. And what is that going to look like? Um, and so that that's how that came to me. Um, when I was working on African icons, it was literally because um, I was getting really irritated by the fact that when people thought about Black history, they really, especially in this country, they very much limited to um, free slaves, the civil rights movement, um, post reconstruction, that's, you know, like, th that's really all it's a very, very narrow swath of history. And, of course, growing up in Trinidad, you know, with a very, very different kind of black history that happens in Trinidad. I was, you know, much more privy to like a wider world of like, what were Africans doing, you know, prior to colonialism, prior to enslavement and, and stuff like that. And so that's where that idea came from. Um, when I was working on the Jumbies stories, it really was just, I had not seen Jumbies, which are these creatures in Caribbean mythology. I had not really seen them in books and I wanted to introduce my kids to them. So it's always like, what is the thing that I'm thinking of? And this would make a good picture book. This would make a good nonfiction, sort of longer expanded book, middle grade. This would make a good, um, you know, middle grade novel or, or whatever it is. Like the, the idea comes and then it's, who is this for, you know, and that, Mm-hmm. that kind of decides the, the sort of format that I will be writing in. Um, but once I get to the actual writing, a lot of it process wise works the same for me. Uh, I usually start longhand, just jotting things down, whether it's a picture book or a novel, or, you know, even with the graphic novel, um, the history comics, Rosa Parks and Claudette Colvin started with me just writing out ideas longhand and after I get to a certain point and I feel like I can start to coalesce some of these ideas I might start trying to um, figure out how these things might go in what order they might go and it works the same for longer formats as well as picture books you know like I, I do kind of you know, what kind of thing is going to happen first, what next, 
what kind of order are they going to go in? So I do this sort of thing with reshuffling. I, I tend to use um, sticky notes a lot or um, index cards when I'm working just to be able to like move things around and, and see. Um, also, it feels very ephemeral um, if you need to throw something out. Like it doesn't feel like you're throwing out this whole like major thing. It's like a sticky note. It doesn't work. You just, you know, replace it. It, it doesn't feel so you know, big and dramatic, like in the early stages when I'm doing something like that. But yeah, the process is often the same regardless of what kind of format, but it always starts with what's the idea, then who's it for um, mm -hmm. will inform like, you know, how it's going to go. And then it's like, okay, let's do this thing. How we, you know, let's write out what we got and try to figure it out. Because I always feel like I'm, I don't know what I'm doing ever. At the beginning, I don't know how it's going to go. I don't know what's going to happen in the story. So um, physically writing it by hand always feels like a good way to get it out of me so I can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask what it was like working in graphic novels. So it sounds like uh, there are certain fixtures in your process that you carry across. Yeah, with the graphic novel, um, because this was the first graphic novel I have done, um, I had to learn how that works. Um, mm -hmm. And what I learned is that um, like the way that I think when I'm writing a regular narrative, I think in motion mm -hmm. and with a graphic mm -hmm. novel, you can't do that. You have to think in a, a still and the still has to suggest motion maybe, but it can't actually move. And so a lot of the notes that I got back from my first pass was that in this one panel, you can't have them doing three things. <laughs> like, <laughs> correct, because you can only have them showing like one thing. So you, you have to really think in snapshots. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So with the graphic novel, I found myself actually drawing it out next to the notes. Oh, like, wow. what would yeah. this look like? Like, what would be the best way to represent this, right? Like somebody running next to a car, right? But that's the only thing you can see. But you can tell, like, what happened before or what happens after, like where they're going or where they come from. You can, you can in the, in the line work, you can say what the motion is, but you have to be thinking of the static moment. And that was a harder... That was a hard thing for me to figure out. So I did start like doing in my very terrible drawing, um, drawing little panels so that I could figure it out so that I wasn't like trying to do three things <laughs> in one yeah. panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you you have a busy season ahead with a couple of book releases. And right. Love mythology, love science fiction, anything that you'd like to mention about what folks can expect from those stories and, and the inspirations. Sure. So Mocha Magic Carnival Chaos, that's the one right there. Mm -hmm. um, that is the one that's out. It is out on August 6th. And it is about three cousins who discover that they have the powers of a Moko Jumbi. And Moko Jumbies are these, uh, you know, like people sort of know them as the guys who are up on stilts during carnival and they're dressed up and they're super fun and they're like dancey and playy and everybody loves them. And it's like a big thing during carnival. Like people see them and every it's like a lot of joy, right? Mm -hmm. Um and the tradition of the Moko goes back to West Africa, where Mokos were healers, and they were people who um, would, they could heal, they could protect, but they also were like the holders of the stories. Um, so in my version, um, they are able to, to see into the past, into the future, in, you know, like see things in the present that other people cannot see. Mm -hmm. And the the story of the first Moko Jumbi, how the Moko Jumbi got its super long legs is that there was a Moko, a healer in West Africa who was following a slave ship um, out into the ocean. And as he walked out into the ocean, rather than sinking under the water, his legs stretched out to keep his body above the water. So he could, follow the slave ship all the way across the Atlantic. Um, so I use that and this idea of this sort of magical mystic, mystical creature 
and I've divided his original powers into three so that the three cousins can each have a power, um, mm -hmm. the power of um, healing, the power of protection, and the power of vision. And these cousins uh, developed this power just before the Caribbean Day Parade on Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn, when um, all of the magical members of the Caribbean community are out showing their magic. And there is some kind of creature that is sucking up people's magic. And, and it's only the Mokos, these three cousins, who can stop it. But first, they have to figure out what it is. Um, so it's mm -hmm. a little bit of a magical mystery um, with, you know, like all of these events happening. But my favorite thing about this book is it is the most Trinidadian book I've done mm -hmm. with all of the food, all of the music, all of the stuff that happens around Carnival. It was absolutely a riotous joy to write this book and write all of the fun things. Um, and so they're in the middle of all of that. And there's all of this chaos happening um, in the middle of that for these three cousins to, to stop. Um, so that is, that was that one that's coming out in August. And the second one, um, Boy 2.0, which is coming mm -hmm. out in October, my first science fiction is a boy, a boy who, um, he's an artist. He goes out to do some street art and this person comes out with a rifle, shoots at him. And as he's running away, discovers that uh, he's he runs and he's being chased by the police and he discovers that his entire body can go invisible. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to figure out whether or not that is, is he a mutant? Um, has he been created in a lab to be able to do this? Because he's in foster care, so he doesn't know his family history at all. Um, is this natural? Is it unnatural? You know, and as he's trying to figure this out, um, there's a whole bunch of people who discover his ability and now they're after him. So now there's this, mm. this weird tech bro. There's the U.S. military. Um, like everybody kind of wants to get their mitts on this poor kid as he's just trying to figure out who he is and um, escape all of <laughs> all of that mess um, yeah. and and just live his life. So it's um, uh, it's actually uh, sort of uh, built on a Snow White um, on the Snow White fairy tale, but just uh, the complete uh, sort of I, I turn a lot of the elements around. Mm -hmm. um, but but you do have the sort of seven dwarves, the the seven buddies who who help him and. And all that. So that was a lot of fun as well. Um, and I loved getting into the science of it because I have not really done that yet. Yeah, I love that. Very, very cool. Very cool. Lots of uh, fanciful storytelling. And uh, you're a person who it sounds like takes stories, mythologies, fairy tales and sort of mingles them together. So, oh, yeah, that. <laughs> that is that is my absolute favorite thing to do is to find ways to. Um, take all of the fairy tales that I loved as a kid when I decided that I was going to be this big, great writer, because that's kind of what I was doing when I was a little kid. Like I was taking these fairy tales and I was just like taking my crayon to them and just being like, no, no, not this. <laughs> this is bad. Let's change. You know, so I feel like it's basically the same thing. I'm still I'm still playing with my box of crayons, I think. Love it. Love it. Uh, well, if I'm a listener out there, if I'm an educator, a uh, reader who wants to find out more, where might I go to find out more about these books and your projects and uh, your work in general? Sure. So tracybatiste.com is my website and it is chock full of things. If you are an educator, there's um, specifically pages for educators, books that I recommend um, for educators, um, there is a book, uh, a, a page that's specifically for writers. If you want to be a writer and you're interested in that and you don't want to spend a million dollars on an MFA, I, I have like a lot of resources for writers, uh, including some classes that I have pre-recorded. Um, and my, but my favorite, I think, is my kids page where kids can sort of like come into my office and like click around and like find out about different things. And there's fun coloring pages that are related to the books and, and all of that. But of course you can also find out all about the books. Each book has an individual page with um, sometimes like little um, sneak peeks on the inside and um, different activities that you can do and 
any um any recordings or podcasts or anything that I do that have related to the book like are attached to those book pages so um it's a pretty good comprehensive site we worked super super hard <laughs> to like <laughs> make it a really fun page where um you know like really parents educators kids writers could come and like get a lot of information Nice, nice, wonderful. Well, uh, Tracy, glad to to talk with you about your work. Glad to have you back on anytime and excited to share this uh, through YouTube and Spotify and, and other spaces like that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason.